said the Savior, Ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The wide diversity of belief in today's Protestant churches is regarded by many as proof that a union between them can never be made. But for years there has been in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing desire for a union based upon common points of doctrine. The papacy began its rule by the merger of paganism and Christianity, and so it continues to hold the same policy today. Protestantism, passed down to us at such an infinite cost, has yet again been infiltrated, and its spirit almost entirely destroyed. The Bible handed down to us by the blood of millions of martyrs has yet again been set aside for the pleasing fables of paganism and false religion. The ecumenical movement so popular today is often represented by the World Council of Churches, which was fully established shortly after the Second World War in 1948. At that time, 147 churches assembled to promote what was termed Christian unity. WCC member churches today have united the Catholic Church with various Protestant churches, including the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Anglican Church, the Uniting Church, the Mennonite Church, the Quaker Church, as well as many united and independent churches. In total, there are over 349 churches belonging to the WCC membership in more than 110 countries, representing well over 560 million Christians. This so-called Christian unity is heralded by the various Christian churches as a wonderful advancement in the cause of Christ. But the truth of the matter is, it is the greatest indicator of Christendom's spiritual decline. The shocking result of such compromise and apostasy may be seen in the following footage filmed at the World Council of Churches 7th Assembly, which took place in Australia in the year 1991. This assembly was attended by thousands of church leaders from all over the world, and yet, until now, the following footage has been seen by a relative few. I'm sharing with you my image. 
image of the Holy Spirit from my crystal background. This image embodies for me the three changes of direction I have described as a necessary for metanoia. Life of centrism, the habit of interconnection, and the culture of life. The, the image does not come from my academic, academic training as a systematic theologian, but from my gut feeling being in my people's collective unconsciousness that comes from thousands of years of spirituality. For me, the image of the Holy Spirit comes from the image of Kwame. She is venerated as a goddess of compassion and wisdom by East Asian woman's popular religiosity. She is a Bodhisattva in Martin the Bay. She can go into Nirvana anytime she wants to, but refuses to go into Nirvana by herself. Her compassion for all suffering living beings makes her stay in this world, enabling others, other living beings, to achieve enlightenment. Her compassion is wisdom, heals all forms of life, and empowers them to swim to the shore of Nirvana. Perhaps this might also be a feminine image of the Christ, who is the first born among us, one who goes before and brings others with her. While the wind of the Holy Spirit blows to us, let us welcome her, letting ourselves go in a wild rhythm of life. Come, Holy Spirit, give you the whole creation. Amen. Two years after the Seventh Assembly, Australia was again the venue for a monumental step in this so-called church unity, when the Catholic Church officially united with various Protestant churches on a national level. The following interviews were shot in 1994 and speak for themselves. When we begin a ceremony such as the one in Canberra, the National Council of the Church's inauguration, I think it's very important to recognize the original people of this land and to have them introduce us to it, so to speak. The church down the centuries has gone to new cultures and has found ways of relating to those cultures and in many instance, instances has brought uh, wealth from those cultures in their music and their movement and all those things, their thinking, their, their spirituality into the Christian tradition. So that's all going on. and. Uh, uh, and that's a big issue today, but naturally the Aboriginal people bring to the Christian faith their own traditions of the worship and, uh, and the spirituality of dance and music, and there's nothing unchristian or anti-Christian about those. There's a place for all of those in the Christian tradition. <laughs> Martin, what dances are you from? Mangandai dances. 
Um, that's our home town where we're from, up in north west of New South Wales. And you performed down in Canberra at the inauguration yeah. a few weeks back. Yep. That was the same dance that you danced today? Yeah. With the rocks? Yep. Could you explain that a little bit more for us? Um, well, at the time, that dance is just to show people and to tell people that um, when you go out on sacred sites, you must have the permission of an elder. If you don't have permission, then you're not supposed to be there. But at, at the time, one time, a young brave warrior goes out on his own. He didn't want to listen or learn. And he comes upon these rocks, and these sacred rocks, and he starts to play with them. And when he's playing with them, he knows it's wrong. And the rocks come to life to scare him and to warn him to stay away from that area or his soul will be taken forever. So that's an initiation to come onto sacred ground yeah. for an Aboriginal? Yep. Does that have anything to do with Christianity? Nah, it doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. So you, that's, that's strictly your culture and your yeah. spirituality? Yep, that's just our beliefs. The church, simply because it is comprised of people, has to take on board the cultures and the customs and the perspectives of people. It does so critically. I mean, it's, it's not about to baptize everything that, that human beings have ever done, but I think it's entirely legitimate that the church should look at Aboriginal traditions in the same way as we've looked at other traditions and ask now, how can these be brought into the, the service of God? Mm -hmm. so, somebody once, I remember somebody saying in an ecumenical meeting years ago, culture is important because culture is the human voice that answers the voice of God. And there I think the church and its ecumenical structures should be willing to find allies wherever they're offering. United Nations, other groups that are working for a fair deal for Aboriginal people, whatever. Let's not be shy of, of finding our companions in, uh, in groups that have no necessary connection with the Christian faith or maybe even people of other faiths. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see our Council of Churches holding out its hands in friendship to people of other faiths in Australia, building bridges of understanding across the gulfs of the centuries of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the uh, interesting points during the inauguration was the service in St. Christopher's Cathedral mm -hmm. in Canberra, which began with uh, smoke being used as a symbol of cleansing uh, according to Aboriginal culture. So there were some Aboriginal young people there who were smoking the congregation. It, in Aboriginal culture, you go through a smoking ceremony as part of your preparation, the cleansing of the heart and mind uh, as you approach God. So we were using that little piece of Aboriginal symbolism in our service. Now, I've had no phone calls of protest, to my surprise, and, and uh, no angry letters, but I'm sure there were some people out there who said, well, wait a minute, what's this pagan symbolism, pagan ceremony? It is impossible for us, with the Bible within our reach, to honor God by false opinions. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are always the ways of death. Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin when there is every opportunity to know the will of God.